Good morning, everybody. I uh, woke up this morning, last night, can you hear me okay? Last night when I was going to bed, I was reminding my wife that I had to get up early in the morning to come out to Trinity and do chapel. And she started to laugh, and I said, why are you laughing? That's not funny. She said, well, because like Stephen said, I went to Trinity. My wife actually went to Trinity. And when I went, I did the REACH program, so I did it unconventionally. They didn't make us go to chapel. Uh, my wife, though, did it conventionally and had to come to chapel. And she said, this late in the semester, on a Friday, the only people going are the ones that got to be there. The, the only people that are going to be there, Josh, are the people on chapel probation. <laughs> And I said, how do you know that? And she said, because I spent a lot of time on chapel probation. And I thought, you're my wife. How can this be possible? You're supposed to love going to church all the time. And she doesn't. Uh, anyway, let's talk about elephants for a minute. Uh, because elephants, to me, are the Cheerios of the animal kingdom. Cheerios, not honey nut Cheerios, not apple cinnamon Cheerios. There's even chocolate Cheerios now. I'm talking about straight up Cheerios. They're boring. They're not exciting. Nobody, when they stand in that endless aisle of cereals, goes, yep, I'm getting Cheerios. No sugar, no flavor, nothing straight oats. Nobody signs up for that. Same thing with elephants, right? When you go to the zoo, how many of you have been to the zoo like in your life ever? A few of you. The zoo is well worth your time, but most people just kind of pass by the elephants. We get really excited about the lions. We get really excited about giraffes. We get really excited about the bird area where they're flying all over the place. But nobody gets excited about elephants. You know why? Because they put the, the habitat out in the middle of the zoo, and it's just kind of the crossroads of the place. You're just passing through. And they're never doing much, right? The tail just wags back and forth, and they're eating every once in a while. Nothing very exciting. But I thought I'd share a few facts with you about elephants that I think are incredible. Did you know that the average elephant weighs 600 pounds? That's a ton of mass moving around. Did you know this? Animals or elephants are not afraid of mice. Remember in the cartoons how they always show the elephant gets all freaked out when the mouse comes on the scene? They're not afraid of mice at all. You know why? Because an elephant could squash a mouse. Why would they be afraid of it? But what they are afraid of are bees. They're terrified of bees. But we're big too, and we're afraid of them, so we won't judge them for that fear. In their trunk, there are 400 pounds of muscle. It's the strongest muscle in their whole body, and in a lot of ways, it's the strongest muscle of any animal anywhere in the animal kingdom. Last one, and this is the thing that is so crazy to me. When, a, when an elephant gets pregnant, they carry the baby elephant in their stomach for 22 months. That's just shy of two years that they carry that elephant. That is mind-boggling to me. Now, elephants have zero to do with what I'm going to talk about this morning. Like, zero. We're not going to talk about elephants anymore. But the reason I bring them up is because there's one in the room. There's one in the room that nobody wants to talk about. There's this truth out there in life that especially church people, especially Christians, do not want to admit is there. We avoid it. We dance around it. We come up with cliche kinds of answers to hard questions, right? We, we give real we give real life questions, these big theological answers, and people look at us like, really? That's not the answer I was hoping for. Because we're dancing around the truth. And here's the truth. Most of the time, life does not go according to plan. Most of the time, your life is not going to go the way you drew it up. It's just not. But sometimes what happens is you go to church and your pastor or some guest speaker gets up in front and they say things like, hey, if you trust in Jesus and you give your life to God, then everything's going to be sunshine and rainbows from this point forward. And then Monday comes. Or then finals week happens. And you're going, wait a minute. 
I thought it was supposed to be all good from here, and it's not all good. Somebody lied to me. But the truth of life is this, that it doesn't go according to plan. You remember when you were a middle school student? Wasn't it fun being a middle school student? You didn't care about anything. It was just fun to be middle school students. Actually, I hated it. I won't lie to you. But when you were a middle school student, you had this view of the future that was all kinds of ideal, right? If you were on the basketball team in middle school, you were pretty sure that you were going to be an NBA superstar. That's just how it was going to go. And if you slept over at a friend's house and they had a karaoke machine and you got up and you sang your favorite Britney Spears song and all the other people at the sleepover said, you've got pipes, you thought, I'm going to be the next American Idol. I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to pull it off, right? We lay out these plans for how life is going to go. go. Go back just however long ago you started at Trinity. You probably said, I'm going to study I'm going to do my assignments. I'm going to get good grades. I'm going to sleep often. And then something happened. And you fast forward to November 3rd and you're thinking nothing went according to plan. And what happens when nothing goes according to plan is we move into a place called Disville. And here's what Disville is all about. Disappointment discontentment, dissatisfaction. In our relationships, when they don't live up to the plan, it's disloyalty. And it's just all about how things have let us down. And some of us go to bed on a very regular basis depressed because we live in Disville, where nothing went the way that we drew it up. So the question I want to ask you is who's to blame and a lot of people look at me and go, well, it's not me. And you know what? In a lot of cases, it isn't you. But then the Christian kids go, well, don't you dare blame God. Can't be God's fault because God's good all the time, right? But maybe it is God's fault. I'll be the first preacher to stand up here and say, sometimes your life doesn't go according to plan because God didn't let it. And I want to explain what I mean by that. Because I think that that's actually a truth that should be good news to you. Because sometimes your purpose in life is different than your plan. But I want to explain that by talking about Job. If you grew up in the church, you've probably heard Job and his story before. It's this great c catastrophe. But I want to look at the very start where it all kind of gets started with him and all the bad things that go wrong for him and examine how he responds to those things. Because what I want to help you with this morning is to not go, whose fault is it? But to go, okay, well, what do I do now? What's my next step? Things fell apart. Things fell off the tracks. What do I do now? What does this mean? So if you're going to follow along in a Bible, we're going to be in the book of Job, chapter 1, starting in verse 1. But it's right up here on the screen if you want to read along with me. It says, in the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and he had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. That would be awesome to have that title. Like, I'm the best in all of my region. Job has a great family. He has a lot of money, a successful business, and a stellar reputation. He's the greatest man among all the people in the East. He's blessed. He's got everything going for him. And my guess is if you sat down with Job at this point and you said, hey, Job, are things going according to plan? He would have said, absolutely. In fact, they're going better than the plan I wrote up. Things could not be better than how they are right now. Everything is just about perfect. Now, what I want you to notice is missing. One of the funnest ways to read the Bible, by the way, is to ask the question, what's not in this verse? And what's not in this verse is shaming because Job has a good life. 
Sometimes you hear that creep through in Christian conversations, and we shame people that have it good. We shame people that have some money. We shame people that have been successful because we think every Christian in the world should be broke and sad. Because that's the pictures of Jesus that we hang up everywhere, isn't it? He's sad all the time. My favorite pictures of Jesus are the ones where he's smiling. I think he smiled more than he did anything else. So this is not a verse about, hey, if your family or your family of origin has some stuff put together and things are going well for them, this is not a verse to make you go, and you should feel bad about that. Because that's not the message. That's not why what happens next happens. Because the other thing that's not in this verse is that Job was an evil, wicked, rebellious person. Because sometimes we want to think bad things happen to bad people, but reality is bad things happen to good people all the time. And Job is one of those good people. Let's read on in verse 6. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright. A man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You've blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and his herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. He won't cure you. He'll he'll curse you. This is an interesting passage to me because Satan tells God, you rigged the game for him. He's got it so good. You're so proud of Job and how righteous he is and how loyal he is to you, but you rigged it. He's got everything going for him. Of course he loves you. Everybody loves you when you do good by them. Everybody's loyal when they're comfortable. So of course Job is good, God. It's interesting here, by the way, in in the original language, it's more the Satan, not just Satan. It's a title, which means accuser or slanderer. In other words, what the devil does so well is make stuff up to ruin someone's reputation. But here's what I want you to notice. He is not here to ruin Job's reputation. You know whose reputation he's after? God's. Remember in the New Testament when you read that our battle is not against flesh and blood? This is proof. There's a battle being waged between God and the devil, and Satan is all about ruining his reputation. And yes, God, you get glorified and you get praised, and people go to Christian colleges and churches and all this stuff, but you give them money, and you take care of them, and you provide for them. If you didn't do that, they would curse your name. And I just imagine that God, in all his cosmic glory, looks at Satan and says, Oh, really? try him. You try him. And notice here what God doesn't do again. He doesn't say you can go after him because he's done X, Y, and Z wrong. He says you can go after him because he will prove that I'm all I say I am. You can go after him because he's good. I actually like him. Sometimes we think God has bad things or allows bad things in our lives because he doesn't like us. We have this idea of God that he loves us because he's God and that's in his job description and he's required to, but he doesn't particularly like us and that's why he smites us. But what if, what if God allows challenges into your life so that you can prove he's as good as he says he is? What if you're the trophy on his mantle? What if you're the one he's bragging about? Because sometimes the bad things like Job in his life, they didn't come because he was a bad person. They actually came because God liked him best. And that is an upside down, maybe confusing view of how God looks at us. But that is how he looked at Job. Jump a few into the next verse. Verse 12 
It says, The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when Job's sons and daughters were fasting and drink, or feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabians attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. I can't imagine being Job, who again has had life going according to plan, and then some, to this point, all of a sudden his servant runs in and says, Job, all of your business, all of your wealth, all of your riches has fallen apart. It's gone. There's not one donkey left. There's not one oxen left. There's not one servant left. They took all the riches and they killed all your servants. Job, you are broke. What would your reaction have been? I'd tell you what mine would be. I'll just be honest with you. I'd have been really angry at God. Because all of a sudden, he's not keeping me comfortable. I would have done exactly what Satan thought Job would do. God, this is not according to plan. You must not be all that good after all. But it doesn't stop there. It gets even worse. Jump to verse 18. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house It collapsed on them, and they are dead. And I'm the only one who's escaped to tell you. I have four sons, and the sun rises and sets on them in my world. They they are my everything, my greatest source of joy. And if I lost all of them at the same time, if I lost just one of them, you would have to lock me up. I would fall apart. So I cannot imagine in a span of two minutes hearing that everything I had to my name has been taken from me, then all of my children are dead. Again, I ask you, how would you respond if God took all of your financial resources and all of your family in one foul swoop. You might be angry too. Just think about how angry you got when you didn't pass the test. When you got broken up with. When your parents split up. Think about how angry and frustrated and alone and disappointed and dissatisfied and discontent you were then. Can you imagine being in Job's shoes? The train has fallen off the tracks in every sense of the word. But the way Job responds is absolutely mind-boggling to me. And if I were ever put in such a dire situation, if I could respond half as well as Job did, I'd feel like I really accomplished something. Look at verse 20. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Job's response, by the way, is not one that's robotic. I think sometimes it's easy to read that and go, wow, God really had him brainwashed. I mean, all this stuff happens to him, and he just turns around and prays this prayer. Understand the amount of grief that he expresses. In his culture, when you tear your clothes and you shave your head, that was, that's an outward expression of the deepest levels of sorrow. 
And you read a little bit further, and Job sits in ashes for a long, long time. And he weeps, and he weeps, and he weeps. This isn't Job just being uncaring or unloving or totally detached from all emotion. That's not the case at all. He is broken. And yet his response is, may God be praised. And here's what's incredible about that response. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years later, you and I are reading about it. You and I are looking at Job as the example of how to respond and navigate difficult circumstances in our life. And when you think about the conversation between God and Satan that took place right before this, you start to realize there's something bigger going on here than just Job's situation on earth. And this is what I want you to hear this morning. If, if you want to just wake up for the next 35 seconds and then go back to sleep after this sentence, that's fine with me. I also recommend this as your next tattoo if you're looking for one. Your purpose may not fit into your plan. The purpose that God has for your life What he's going to do in and through you and all of your difficult circumstances may not fit into the plan that you drew up when you were in middle school. It may not fit into the plan that you drew up when you landed on TIU's campus. It may not fit into the plan that even earlier this week you were dreaming about your future when one day you are the CEO or one day you are the pastor or one day you are the whatever, fill in the blank. You need to understand that whatever that plan is may not be big enough for what God wants to do through you, what God wants to show the world through you. Your purpose may not fit into your plan. And here's what I want you to know in that. Your plan is always about you. It's always what you want. It's always what you're comfortable with. But your purpose, according to God and how he wrote the plan, his plan, is always about him. When you think in terms of purpose over plan, it changes the game. Now you go back to Job, Satan comes back to God and he goes, okay, okay, okay. You got me. He didn't curse you. But just remember, you didn't let me touch him. I did everything around him, but you didn't tell me I could touch him. So God says, okay. He's up for the task. Go ahead. Job becomes so sick and so stricken with sores and all of this stuff. I mean, let's take the inventory of what's gone. Business, family, now health, what is left? All he's left with, by the way, is a wife who comes to him. Read this. It's a fascinating interchange. She says, why don't you just go kill yourself? That's a loving marriage. Why don't you just go curse God? He did this to you. But what Job does is he looks at the cards he's been dealt and he accepts them. If you jump into chapter 2 of Job, you read in verse 9 these words. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He He replied, Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. You read this over and over again. In all this, Job did not sin. In all this, Job did not sin. Job says, should we accept just the good from God? That that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem fair. We have to accept the bad as well. This is not Job becoming a victim. This isn't him throwing his arms in the air and saying there's nothing I can do about this. The ship is going down, so it's all bad and not... This isn't him giving up. This is him saying, God's in control. This is God focused more, this is Job focused more on God's sovereignty than his charity. And some of you are elbow deep in a relationship with God that is all about his charity. Give to me, provide for me, make me comfortable, make me feel good, bless my plans. And God says, I am charitable, but I am also sovereign, and I've got a purpose for you that's actually better than your plan if you just pay attention. 
if you just listen, if you just let me be in charge. My purpose does not fit into your plan. Your purpose in this life may not fit into your plan. So I don't know what your major is. I don't know what your plan is for second semester. I don't know what your plan is for Christmas break. But you better consider holding it loosely and offering it up and saying, God, you are sovereign. And if you've got purposes that are different than my plan, I want to be on purpose with you. And here's what's amazing. When we're willing to do that, we're given this promise by Jesus himself in John 16, verse 33. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. That's a promise. But take heart. I've overcome the world. You're going to have trouble. It's not going to go perfect. But just know, I win. Here's what's so cool about Jesus. He's the author and he's the main actor. He's not only writing up the purpose and the plan and the strategy and all that. He's saying, I'm going to be in that with you and I will carry you and I will guide you and I will hold you up so that you can have peace. And so this is the question that you and I have to wrestle to the ground today. Is Jesus looking you in the face going, do you trust me? Because I believe that that's what Job had to answer every time something new happened. Do I trust God? And Jesus looks at you and I and he says, listen, there's going to be a lot that's going to happen that you didn't plan for. There's going to be a lot that you plan for that's not going to happen, but do you trust me? You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have it all figured out, but do you trust me? And again, just to be transparent, I don't want to act like I always trust him the way I should. There are times where I am fearful and where I'm doubting, and that played out in no more vivid color than a couple years ago when I took a student ministry team to Haiti. And we were going to do VBS and a whole week of work down there, and it was going to be really great. We were really excited. We flew into Haiti, um, and it's crazy. If you've ever been there, it it is third world in every sense of the word, word, and it's a different world in every sense of the word. So we get off the airplane, and we're looking for our host. We find them. They take us outside, and they start walking us towards our transportation from the airport to five hours from the airport where we're going to be doing ministry out in the middle of nowhere in Haiti. You look at Haiti as a country, we were going to be right in the middle. Circle it and put nowhere. That's where we were going to be. We were walking up to what I thought was a broken down school bus. But it was actually the school bus that we were going to ride those five hours out to nowhere. And so we climbed on board, and there's holes in the seat, and it smelled bad, and they go to start the bus, and it doesn't start, and they try a second time, and it doesn't start, and I'm starting to go, this is not going to be good. But eventually they get it going, and we, we take off, and Haiti is very mountainous, and so we're driving, and it's like, you remember that old story about the train, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Well, we're in the bus, and it's, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And we get on the side of this mountain, and all of a sudden, the bus went, I'm not doing this anymore. And it, it died. And it was dark. Now, we're in the middle of nowhere, in a foreign country where they don't speak a lot of English, and I have 20 students in high school whose moms and dads I promised I would keep safe in the dark in the middle of Haiti. And so we are trying to make phone calls. Cell phones don't work real great there, so we're trying to get in touch with other people. We are literally on the side of a mountain. So there is traffic whizzing up the blind side of the road and coming up and buzzing by us, and kids are getting out of the bus because they got to go to the bathroom. And it was like the apocalypse had happened. We were, it was crazy. We're holding up sheets for the girls and all kinds of nonsense. And I realized, uh, without saying anything, that there were people in the bushes on the other side of the street. And every few minutes, there would be a few more people. And then I realized those people are carrying machetes. And I started thinking, Jesus, it'll be nice to meet you 
face to face. Because here I come. I was just terrified. I was the high school pastor. Our middle school pastor was there with us. And you know what he decided to do? He goes into the back of the bus and he pulls out his guitar. And he brings the guitar back around the front and he climbs up and he starts leading. I'm out panicking, having sweats like crazy. And he's in there leading the kids in worship. And I remember getting kind of angry with him. Because I'm like, dude, they're going to hear you. They're going to they're gonna come get us. You need to be quiet. We need to turn all the flashlights off, all of this. But he was just determined the best way for us to fight fear is to call out to Jesus. Because he said, I'll give you peace. And he said, when trouble comes, I'll carry you through it. And so we start, they start singing. And I realized in that moment where my friend had learned to do that. He learned to respond that way in the waiting room of a hospital where his mom died while he was in high school. He faced Job kind of situations. And instead of being fearful and instead of going, God, this isn't according to plan, so now I'm mad at you, he sang praises about how great is our God. And I felt about that big. Because what Eric did that I didn't was say over and over again, Jesus, I trust you. These are the cards that you've dealt me. These are the cards that you've dealt us. I accept them. And I trust that they are the best possible cards. Your purpose may not fit into your plan. Because today, if you sat down with any high school student that was on that trip, they're not going to talk about VBS. They're not going to talk about what we did with the building that we built. They're not going to talk about any of that. They're going to talk about the bus and where they learn to conquer fear by trusting Jesus. The purpose was bigger than the plan we had for how Haiti was going to go. So I'm going to wrap up, but I want to give you one idea to help you navigate the next time things don't go according to plan. I'm daring you to go out to Walgreens or Target or Walmart and buy a deck of cards, just a deck of playing cards. Some of you have a ton of these in your room. You don't even need to go buy them. (laughs) Here's what I want you to do with that deck of cards. I want you to keep it in a place where you're not going to use them. But this is your extra deck. And the next time things don't go according to plan, the next time you get dumped, the next time the test doesn't go the way you thought it would, the next time you don't have money to pay your school bill, whatever the case may be, that things don't go according to plan. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that deck, and I want you to just throw all the cards up in the air and let them fall all over the place. And so here's what you have now, a 52-card mess. But as an act, as a physical act of accepting the cards that you've been dealt, you're just going to start picking them up. But here's what you're going to do different. With every card you pick up, you're going to say these words, Jesus, I trust you. And then you'll pick up a second card, Jesus, I trust you. Third card, Jesus, I trust you, until you've picked up and said 52 times, Jesus, I trust you. These are not, this is not my plan. I've got a mess on my hands. But I want you to know, like Job trusted you in his mess with the cards that you gave him, I trust you. I don't know that it'll work out perfect. I don't know that it'll go all well. But I want you to know this. I trust you, and I praise you, and I accept the bad with the good. I accept that my purpose may not fit into my plan. Let's pray. Lord, it's easy to stand up here and say things like that. And then when I go home, there will inevitably be something that I don't do a very good job of trusting you with, something that's not on my plan for the day. So I'll selfishly pray for myself first that you would allow me to have the strength to trust you in the midst of hard times. And Lord, for my friends in this room, there's, 
There's not a room in the country right now more full of people who could say things aren't going the way I thought they were going to go. And I'm disappointed. And I'm discontent. And I'm dissatisfied. And for some of us, we've become disengaged from you because we look at this as all your fault. But Lord, we want to confess that we're sorry for thinking that way. And we want to thank you for thinking enough of us to give us the challenges. And we want to be the kind of people that make you proud, that prove to the others around us that you are exactly who you say you are, that you really are good all the time. So Lord, give my friends the strength and the courage to know and live in the truth that your purpose for them might be bigger than their plans.